Excellent. Peter. So um, Peter is the CEO of the Costas uh, Research Institute in Northeastern. Um, so I'm sure Peter, you're going to tell everybody what that, that is, right? But uh, I will say, I remember when it was being established a few years ago, um, Peter will tell you what, what the name is about, which is always fantastic, right? And maybe if you're nice to him, he'll give you a tour of some of the basement accommodation. So Peter, over to you if you're ready for your... Um, um, you're good, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Wasim. I'd like to uh, share just a few slides to kick us off and then uh, I'll introduce our uh, very impressive and talented uh, panel and then we'll move through the presentations. Um, it's all yours. Okay, hold on. And I can see it, Peter. Okay, you can see that all right? Perfect. Very good. Um, so uh, I wanted to just start out by explaining what is this KRI and Northeastern Innovation Campus that you keep hearing about. And it's a 14 acre campus, actually a former Army Nike missile base located uh, in Burlington, uh, about 20 miles north of our main campus in downtown Boston. We have several facilities, the Costas Research Institute. We have since built an even larger uh, institute facility to house additional uh, partners on the campus. And of course, we have the fabulous uh, drone testing facility that uh, Matt just showed you in his slide. Our model on Northeastern's innovation campus is by design different than our main campus. Our theme there is co-location industry and government labs uh, physically co-located with our academic labs. And examples of our industry partners uh, include uh, Rogers Corporation, Raytheon, AeroVironment, VRC Metal Systems, uh, government partners. And these are not just visitors. They're embedded with their facilities on our campus, include the Air Force's counter small UAS program, on December 23rd, we just uh, completed construction of a second embedded Air Force lab, a systems integration lab on our campus. ARL Northeast is uh, at the Costas Institute and that is their office to serve uh, all of New England. Uh, the National Innovation um, uh, Security Network, uh, Ensign is now also based at uh, KRI serving all of Northeast, uh, all of uh, New England. Um, in addition to those, we have uh, currently 17 early stage companies and we've just tripled our space for early stage companies. So we have room for another 20. Uh, we've brought on six during COVID, another two this month and uh, two more expected the end of this month. So very good demand signal. And those early stage companies cover a range of technologies, uh, sensors, uh, heavy emphasis on drones, life sciences, uh, among others. Um, the idea of this co-location is really to uh, 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 focus on, highlight, and accelerate collaboration. So uh, we uh, have a research projects with our academic uh, researchers, our industry partners, our government partners, and they're all co-led. So you'd have a university PI and an industry PI. And we like to say that these projects are co-owned. Now, by that, we're not referring to IP, although we have very good IP policies for our industry members as well. When we say co-owned, what we mean by that is that the direction and execution of these research projects are really owned by those two PIs to keep it moving in the right direction and hit our timelines and uh, deliverables. These are just examples of some of the facilities. Of course, Matt already talked to you about our uh, drone lab, the indoor and outdoor. But just another example, we, over the last year, won the DARPA built uh, Coliseum tool. This is a supercomputer with uh, many software defined radios. It is the largest RF emulator in the world. Uh, that is now installed and operating on the campus. So the type of capability that gives us with our partners is to be able to model over very large geographic areas, very complex RF transmission interferences jamming. And of course, when you have that type of high-end modeling, the very next thing you'd like to do is to actually test it. And so right next door, we have our very large anechoic chamber. 
where we can test over the air. So with that, I'd like to introduce our very impressive panel. I don't want to take too long on the bios, but I have to say, I really want to, I really want to uh, introduce you to some of these people in some little bit of detail because they just have such impressive backgrounds. So we have six members of the panel. They're divided into three teams. Uh, the first team that I'll talk about is the UMass Amherst uh, and Raytheon team. Uh, Apoorva Bajaj is the innovation manager uh, for adaptive sensing of the atmosphere at UMass Am Amherst. He led the development of technology to support safe routing of remotely piloted uh, vehicles around weather. He manages his team's uh, activities with NASA. Um, and he will be speaking on his team with Ralph Stoffer, who is an operational meteorologist, 30 years uh, active duty in the Air Force, 10 years as a, a civilian SES with uh, DOD, uh, and oversaw uh, Air Force weather programs with over 4,000 uh, personnel, uh, and uh, did some of his work in uh, both the Antarctic and Arctic. Uh, he's uh, currently a senior solutions architect with uh, focus on weather missions at Raytheon. The second group uh, as part of our panel is the AeroVironment Northeastern KRI team. Uh, Dr. Tom Bannock is the vice president, manage, managing director of AeroVironment's Innovation Center, now located also at the Costas Research Institute. Uh, Tom uh, joined AeroVironment to stand up that center in 2019. Uh, really focused on product development in the New England area, uh, primarily small multi-rotor UAVs. Uh, Tom has a lot of experience in uh, robotics, underwater, air, and space. Uh, he co-founded and led Instant Eye Robotics, uh, Vice President of Disruptive Technologies, uh, and Vice President at Aurora Flight Sciences. Um, and with uh, Tom will be uh, Matt King, Kling, who you just heard Heard of uh, Matt, by the way, is our senior research uh, scientist at uh, KRI uh, with the drone cage. He helped design and build that uh, drone cage and he leads it. Uh, and he also, uh, as uh, Waleed had mentioned, has spent time uh, 15 years at Raytheon working on SATCOM and radar systems. And the third team, which is our MIT AI accelerator uh, and Air Force team, uh, includes uh, Captain Victor Salsa Lopez, uh, an airman assigned to the U.S. Air Force and MIT, uh, received his degree in aeronautical engineering from the Air Force Academy, and a graduate degree from uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, Salsa is a distinguished graduate of his pilot training class and an M29 instructor pilot. Salsa has nearly 2,000 combat hours over the last four years. Thanks for joining us, Salsa. And he will be joined by Sartesh Karaman, who's an associate professor at uh, MIT. His research is looking at embedded systems, mobile robotics, uh, worked on a number of unmanned uh, vehicles. His most, research, most recent research on flying robotics looks at the spectrum from the miniature micro drones to agile super drones. So we have an absolutely terrific team uh, in our panel today. And with that, I'd like to uh, move on to uh, the first group, which will be uh, Apoorva and Ralph. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. So quick uh, sound check and making sure everyone can see my screen. Perfect. All good. Is that chat window in the way? Probably not. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm going to kick this off with this nice uh, photograph of UMass Amherst. Uh, I hope you have a chance to come out to our campus uh, in the summer or in the fall. It's sometime soon waiting to get back to the campus as soon as I can after COVID. Uh, so I got my master's degree in electrical engineering here at UMass. And this was around 2003. Uh, and that's when my affiliation with Raytheon actually started. So over 18 years ago, and we're gonna talk about this particular program and project that we've been working on since then. And I've been supporting this program in many different capacities. Um, 
In 2003 is when our CASA Engineering Research Center was founded. Uh, it was funded by the National Science Foundation and it, Raytheon joined as a primary you know, industry consortium member at the time. And I was recruited as the industry liaison officer uh, for CASA. So you know, that's how I've been engaged with Raytheon for the last uh, 18 years. Next slide here, okay. Um, so that was a little bit about me and we've got uh, Ralph Stoffler as well. And uh, you heard uh, an introduction to him. Now Ralph I've known just for the last year or so and he's joined Raytheon recently and we've been working together on a lot of standards uh, related work together as well. So it's a pleasure to have Ralph on here with me. So when we started the center, you know, the big engineering challenge that together with Raytheon we were trying to solve was one associated with improving the way severe weather warning is done in the nation. And as you know, you know, large long range uh, Doppler radars used by the weather service are primarily how this is done. But there's one big challenge associated with these types of radars. And that's that as the earth curves away, these radar beams continue to go in a straight line and you're unable to see what's going on close to the ground. So when you have events like tornadoes, you might completely miss them or you're just interpolating what you're seeing at the top. So our solution was to together build networks of these small short range uh, radars that could then fill in all of these gaps. So that's how this project started. And you know, what does this have to do with our discussion today with, with UAS and UAM? So this started off as a project for just severe weather and trying to capture all this information down close to the ground. But you know, that's exactly where UAS and UAM vehicles will be flying in the, in the lowest 2000 feet. So that means they're flying into these regions that in many parts of the country just don't have any radar coverage at all. So they don't know what type of weather to expect. And we wanna provide as much weather information as we can to these vehicles because they are flying so close to the ground and they're vulnerable to you know, infrastructure and close to the terrain. So that's one reason why you know, having this particular technology address some of the weather needs for UAS and UAM makes a lot of sense. But the other part about it is that uh, you also want ways to track both cooperative and non-cooperative aircraft that are again flying in that space. So by having a radar solution uh, that basically is a multi-function solution, we can use the same infrastructure to provide both severe weather coverage for the National Weather Service and emergency managers while providing the weather information that's needed by UAS and UAM. And now you have a solution also for uh, tracking all these unmanned vehicles as well. So it's a multifunction solution that we're trying to build, we're trying to address this gap problem. So what went into the design criteria? And this is you know, just an introductory slide to this. So we knew we wanted, uh, you know, the radars themselves to be small in size and low in, you know, in weight so that we could put them on the sides of skyscrapers in the cities and we could put them on cellular towers. And if, in order to get that footprint, uh, we chose to go with the X-band frequency. So it's a high frequency radar that allowed us to bring the size of these radars down to like a meter. And that makes them very amenable to being deployed uh, in these types of settings. Uh, and it also, with the other big requirement was that they needed to be very low power because you want to deploy them on cell towers and you want to deploy them in the city. So you don't want instruments that are going to be taking up a lot of power or radiating a lot of power into the cities. Um, so choosing X-band help us address all of those design constraints uh, while uh, having a limitation that you know you could only go out to about 40 kilometers with these types of units. 
So we basically deploy them as networks of radars. And by deploying these networks of radars, you're able to cover all of those gaps and get that type of resolution you want. The other big design criteria was that we wanted to make these radars in a way that you can get the best weather information that you can get, uh, you know, better than the current systems. And that means being able to distinguish, you know, there are different raindrops from hail, um, you know, weather from drones, drones from birds, basically going to dual polarization capability. That was our next design constraint, you know, helped us to answer that severe weather uh, discrimination problem. And then the last design criteria I wanted to talk about was, you know, if you want to be able to track weather really fast, you want to be able to have very good coverage, and you want to be able to track uh, drones that are moving really fast as well, then you've got to have very rapid updates. And that's where the design criteria, you know, took us to looking at phased array radars. And that's how we start talking now about the Skylar design. Uh, and these basically, with these phased array radars, you can electronically steer the beams and you don't have moving parts. And that keeps down the wear and tear and then it enables you to bring down your overall cost for the system. And a phase array solution is the only way you can do actually simultaneous tracking of weather and of uh, cooperative and non-cooperative targets. So how did we go about uh, this collaboration? Uh, you can see sort of two panels over here. The top panel shows how we did a lot of the research and prototyping and building these units uh, at the university itself through different types of uh, projects and funding that we got from the government, like the National Science Foundation. And you can see how you know, the technology evolved as you go from the left to the right. At the same time, Raytheon, our partner, uh, did its own IRAD, you know, learning from what we learned, uh, licensing technologies when appropriate, when appropriate, commercializing it as appropriate, and uh, basically they followed their own path of technology development as well. At this, while at the same time, every year doing a sponsored project with us, so that while we learned in our prototypes, we could then commercialize some of this technology directly to Raytheon as well and guide them in their technology development. The Skylar radar that's now available was voted as you know, popular science's best of what's new in 2018 for breakthrough multi-mission potential. So here are some slides showing, you know, at UMass, we've got a, a Skylar unit sent by Raytheon to us that we deployed at a tower at the Amherst campus to do activities, you know, comparing uh, how well this radar performed along with, you know, the mechanical radar that we have there on campus. We took the Skylar out on the back of a truck to, uh, to the Midwest and chased tornadoes with it. And you can see some high resolution tornado imagery uh, there's also some great videos on the Raytheon website of uh, students from UMass Amherst and Purdue University going out and doing these experiments with the Skylar units. And so, you know, this, this has taken a while, right, developing the technology and getting it to this stage. But, you know, you can't just focus on the technology maturation. You also have to focus on developing the markets and developing, you know, understanding user needs. So the parallel effort that we had was, uh, you know, through the CASA Engineering Research Center, we deployed uh, different technology demonstrators right from 2003 onwards, uh, uh, networks in Oklahoma and networks in Texas, where we put these radars out in front of uh, emergency managers and the weather service, making sure we're getting input from them on how well they're performing. And this type of demonstration basically put everything uh, in front of users like emergency managers and the weather service. This uh, imagery over here shows our seven radar network in the Dallas Fort Worth area, where we were able to get some real time feedback from users about the value of this type of weather data. And this allowed us then the opportunity that, you know, when the 
uh, opportunities in Dallas-Fort Worth came along with Bell and NASA doing projects in the region to support unmanned vehicles, we could very quickly show the value of this weather data to those entities through the different NASA projects. At the same time, you know, that was talking about the weather piece of this. We also developed uh, the drone tracking capability. So this is back in 2010, you know, Raytheon funded us to do a project at UMass Amherst to demonstrate this capability to track low flyers. At that time, we were worrying about the problem of, you know, drug smuggling planes coming across the border and missing, and our current surveillance systems missing those. You know, we weren't thinking of drones at that time. But you know, as, as we came around to 2015, you know, Raytheon funded additional work at UMass to go out and look at drone signatures. And so we did some of that work. And at the same time, we pursued projects with the National Science Foundation as well in order to use the radars that we have on campus to characterize the radar signatures of various drones. So where are we now? We have our you know, the Skylar units are available now and you can talk to the Raytheon employees about, you know, getting hold of one of those units and setting up test beds. But right here in Massachusetts, we, we continue to have a, a network here. Um, we have our radar at UMass supporting, you know, surveillance uh, in the Western part of the state and the data goes directly to the weather service in Boston and they're able to use this in their decision-making. And we have a network that Raytheon has deployed in uh, Eastern part of the state, you know, at Fort Devens, Marlboro and Burlington, there are three Skylo radars that are deployed over there, uh, acting as our test bed in the Massachusetts area. So we use this type of uh, test beds in the Dallas, I mean, in Massachusetts to support demonstrations, including demonstrations to the DOT folks uh, in the room as well. So I'm gonna, this is my last slide here, um, just talking about some of the key enablers to this partnership between Raytheon and UMass. You know, uh, I think at the outset, it's been a very strong support from leadership, both at Raytheon and UMass. And the way this shows up is, you know, we have a multi-year funding agreement. So it's very easy to identify new projects and go ahead and, you know, execute them quickly. Um, we have a robust IP policy and management structure in place so that licensing does not become an issue. Uh, we have a very active uh, personnel exchange program with them as well, so that our students are constantly getting hired by Raytheon. And then uh, they are sending students, they are sending employees back to us as well in order to support our projects. And then finally, we were very closely linked to their product management teams as well, um, so that you know all our research goals are aligned with their business development goals. And we take part in trade shows together, and we take part in standards committees together. And with that, I want to you know hand over to uh, to Raf and let him talk, uh, let him present his perspective. Raf. All right. So let me just take a couple of minutes. Um... First, thanks for the great comments. Uh, so all of you heard, I'm an operational meteorologist, spent 40 years in the Air Force. Uh, what Raytheon is doing with Skylar is taking on a very significant issue, uh, which probably needs to become more relevant to all of you in the UAS business. Uh, I can tell you that uh, UASs are without question the most sensitive aircraft to weather that are out there. And unfortunately, our weather system, uh, not just in the continental United States, but across the globe is really fixated on fixed wing airliners that are flying very high. Uh, you've already seen that our radar right now covers a lot of things, but it doesn't really cover the lower 400 feet uh, that uh, the UAS is going to operate in. And the other thing is in order for UAS to operate, it needs to be flying in VFR conditions. Right now, only 3% of the continental United States is covered by weather sensors that give you authoritative information on VFR. So we got a lot of work to do in the weather area uh, to make sure that we can successfully fly UASs uh, and comply with FAA guidance and approval. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons that uh, we're building Skylar is to do that because we can give you an integrated solution that tracks the drones, 
and provides the weather information and provides both of those uh, to the operator so you can make rapid changes uh, to what's happening. And, uh, and then the other thing, which is of course keen, it's very high resolution. It doesn't have that curvature of the earth problem. So we can see what's happening from the surface on up, which is very critical. And of course, uh, from an overall perspective, most radars, as you know, rotate. And so you have a volume scan. And while the radar is rotating, you lose the target. You lose the drone where it is. You lose where the weather it is. Because Skylar is a flat panel architecture that doesn't rotate, you miss that particular problem set. So I think those advantages are out there. Uh, if you guys have ideas on what needs to be done, uh, I'm interested in doing that. As uh, Porv already mentioned, I'm, I'm uh, running a working group under ASTM F38 to develop weather standards. And one of the key things we need to come to grips with is, you know, everybody's focused on how to avoid the weather and we're building radars, LIDARs and all those things to do that. But the FAA also wants assurances that we can fly in the good weather. We need to be able to fly with VFR. Right now, there is no good technique out there to officially say that VFR conditions are there. And that's something we're working on. I know we're short on time, so I'll pass it on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Apoorva and Ralph. Um, it's just fantastic to have people with your depth of uh, experience and talent uh, speaking to the group. And speaking of uh, depth of experience and talent, we're going to move on now to the second group in our panel with uh, Tom Vanek, uh, VP for AeroVironment, and our very own uh, Matt Kling from uh, KRI at Northeastern University. So with that, uh, over to you, Tom and Matt. Peter, thank you very much. Let me go ahead and get the, uh, the slides up. Just a quick comm check. Can everyone hear me? Yes, loud and clear. We have your and am I excellent? Thank Over you, Peter. Uh, well, it's a it's a real pleasure being here, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the, this I'm anxious to talk about uh, the collaboration that Aerovironment uh, is setting up with uh, Northeastern and also KRI. Uh, this is this is um, new things for us. We're we're just in the process of hammering out the final agreements, uh, but I think it's going to be very interesting as we move forward, and I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, for those of you who don't know Air Environment, I thought it'd be worthwhile to, to just spend a minute saying uh, who we are. Um, organizationally, we have been around for 50 years. Uh, Dr. Paul McCready uh, started Air Environment, and as you can see in the upper left, the real focus was on uh, human-powered flight, uh, won the Kramer Prize, uh, first, first to have controlled human-powered uh, flight, crossed the English Channel, did some amazing things. Uh, for, based on those uh, early work on Gossamer uh, type structures, moved into uh, other types of, of Gossamer structures, but unmanned in this case. Uh, you can see there in 01, Helios still holds the record for the controlled flight at the highest altitude. Uh, and that was a solar powered aircraft and really groundbreaking technologies. And just recently, the, the um, sort of the next generation of that vehicle uh, has been flown in the stratosphere just last year. So that, that work is, is ongoing. Um, we have, and this is probably what we're most known for, the Raven and, and other unmanned systems used by our militaries and militaries of 50 allied nations. Uh, that, that has been a, a big push uh, at Aero Environment has really allowed the, the organization to grow. Uh, and and has, has really opened up the robotics industry. Uh, what was curiosity before is now very much mainstream. Uh, and part of that, uh, we take pride in, in uh, being able to deliver this to our warfighters and others as, as technology uh, that they could use for doing their mission or their profession. Uh, Switchblade, which is a, a tactical um, munition uh, back in 2012, and most recently, and some of you may have seen this, in 2020, the acquisition of Telerob, which takes us, uh, we've always viewed ourselves as a robotics company, and this now takes us into ground robots, uh, and in the future, if, if I have anything to say about it, uh, into other realms as well. I have a background in marine robotics, and I, I think it would be fascinating if we could get into, into that as well. 
some of the other uh, the images there, other things that we're doing, bottom left, uh, commercial UAS, Quantix uh, is, is a fabulous example of that. Uh, solar powered cars and hydrogen powered aircraft in the upper right, uh, a fair amount of work in uh, biomimicry. Uh, the, the top right was one that I still remember as being completely fascinated by. It was well before I joined the company but a robotic, robotic hummingbird uh, actual size that flew and was maneuverable, it was fantastic. And one that we're mo very proud of right now is we have, we, we worked with JPL in developing a robotic helicopter that's on its way to Mars. So it's exciting work at Aero Environment. So that, that's an introduction. Um, what our real focus is, is, is we are uh, working with Northeastern and with KRI is looking at how we, implement autonomy on our vehicles. Autonomy is really gonna be key, key, whether it's man or unmanned for the future of, of this industry, uh, being able to offload operator workload, et cetera, is, is gonna be one of the, uh, the essential features. Um, and in order to do that, while artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, kind of get, gets all the glory, uh, it really comes down to the, the rest of the system uh, that makes this all work. And in that, the, the sensors, uh, the ability to be self-aware, to understand are your actuators working properly, uh, are, are the, the contact with the ground for ground robots, are you having wheel slippage, all of these things are essential in order for this, this umbrella thing of autonomy to work. Um, as we think about this, the, you know, it, it's a natural thing to kind of look and say, you know, from, from a human, R5 sensors, how do we mimic those? But we have the advantage uh, with robotic systems that we can start to expand beyond what we regularly perceive as R5 sensors and look in, in other spectrums and other ways uh, that allow us to have that situational awareness that's so important for these systems. And I've, I've highlighted with a, with a couple of figures here what those are, the, the one on the left. This is a computer simulation of a chemical plume. Uh, and But we now have technologies that, that have been implemented on unmanned aircraft, for example, where we can do tomographic exploration of that plume, not only understanding where the plume is now, where it is going, uh, what the, the concentration levels are, et cetera. The middle picture is a, a, an image from a gamma ray camera. So now we can actually look at radiological issues and how can we map those. The bottom is a heat map for cellular. Uh, this one is, is, I think, very important. If you think about a, a natural disaster, for example, uh, it, it's probably not surprising that the, the two most important things that you need after a natural disaster, one is water. The second thing is surprisingly cell phone service. You want to be able to contact loved ones or whatever to tell them that you're okay. So if, if that infrastructure is, is compromised in any way, having systems that can go up and sense that, find where the holes are and, and be able to bring in mobile assets to, to recreate that cellular network or other RF networks is important. Uh, and one that's near and dear, of course, to, to our environment, almost all of our systems carry thermal cameras, uh, long wave infrared. Here is one particular image of it. Uh, and one that is, is part of the collaboration that Air Environment is setting up with Northeastern and KRI is really understanding what can we do with thermal cameras besides just giving an operator image of this thermal environment, what else can we do with it? Uh, because we are, uh, we have been for quite a while, uh, unmanned aircraft folks, uh, we are always mindful to size, weight, cost, and computational burden. Uh, as I like to say, it has to, it has to be of zero size, zero weight. Uh, it would be great if it's zero cost and take no computational burden. That would be great for us because anytime you're carrying something on an airplane, you're giving something up. Uh, we know that's not possible. But that's one of the things from an industry perspective, we are always looking at swap C as major uh, requirement drivers for the technology we develop. So the, as I said, it's a new start, the collaboration between AV, KRI and Northeastern. Uh, and what we really wanna do is, is we wanna look at innovative ways that we can use thermal cameras to sense the environment and to allow autonomy 
uh, both in in areas so outside environments as well as, as indoor environments. Uh, from a from an a, a EO perspective, the upper right image uh, is is basically what you would think about if you were operating a, a vehicle with an EO camera in an indoor environment. You look for features, you look for the, the optical flow of those features. It allows you to, to conduct operations. You look for obstacles by looking for features uh, and, and you can create architectures to allow the vehicle to operate in that environment. One of the things you'll notice in that upper image is the thing that stands out is it's really a, the contrast between light and dark between features in the image is, is uh, pretty apparent. And a lot of the algorithms today capitalize on that for easily finding features and being able to, to use those features to navigate and avoid obstacles. Um, but the lower image, and this, this one is, is a little more hard to discern. This is a, a long wave infrared image deep within a tunnel. Uh, and the thing that you'll notice is that it, it's pretty hard to figure out what we're looking at. So I'll explain it a little bit. Um, the top, the sort of the darker top is the ceiling of the tunnel and the darker bottom is the floor of the tunnel. The bright objects in the middle is actually a truck with a couple people standing around it. The things on the left that almost look like pillars, they actually are, they support the ceiling. But when we first started looking at this, we were surprised to see anything. We thought it would be an isothermal environment except for the, the truck and the people. Uh, and so we were surprised that we could see, see anything in this with a long wave infrared camera. Uh, we suspect it's emissivity or other things that are allowing us to see that kind of contrast. But even though we can start to now that you, it's been explained a bit, you can start to say, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm starting to see it. Uh, the, the real challenge is, okay, how do we get the onboard autonomy to be able to pick out features, to be able to navigate, to be able to do something with that image to, to allow this autonomous navigation and obstacle avoidance using a thermal camera in that type of environment. So we, the challenges are it's poor contrast, it's poor resolution. With thermal cameras, it really is the case that the, the cost of the camera scales with pixel pitch and array size. Smaller pixel pitch, which gives you greater resolution, costs more. Larger array size costs more. So you're always you're, you're enlarging pixel pitch shrinking the array size, which makes it an even more challenging problem. So the, the, the collaboration uh, between AeroVironment and, and academia is really going to be, what can we do? Can we do it? Is there a way to use thermal cameras to give us that ability to navigate in environments like this, to avoid obstacles in environments like this? And when you think about the, the performance knobs that you can turn, how far down can we turn those knobs and, and still have it work. Um, my last slide is, is really the way we view, that I view it, and I, I believe most of our environment views, um, how this collaboration works. And, and I want to emphasize, I underline the word collaboration, really is a collaboration. On the right, that's AV. We understand the market. We understand what we're trying to create. Uh, we have focused applications and, and we understand uh, what we need to do, the real world, quote unquote, bounding constraints. On the left, uh, that, that's, that's KRI and Northeastern. The, the, the exploratory research, the really focused in-depth knowledge, uh, the diversity of technical knowledge, have it, being able to look at it from different perspectives, what I called unbridled enthusiasm. Uh, one of the things that I remember being a grad student is I would, I would do things and, and investigate things that probably didn't make a lot of sense by looking at it from a purely uh, theoretical perspective, but in some cases it worked. And it was probably because I was scared to death that my advisor wasn't gonna sign off my thesis. So I took those challenges and I, I took it to the next step in order to get there. But the, 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 the overlap is where it's, it's critically important. Both sides have to have a common knowledge of the technology and the solution space so there is a way to communicate, a way to collaborate that makes the, the collaboration work well. So with that, I will pass it over to Matt for, uh, for his perspective on how we're moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen and just uh, 
let me know. Um, is that coming through clear to everybody? Yep, we have your PowerPoint. Great. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Tom. That was some uh, incredible insights uh, into, you know, what AeroVironment's trying to do with its uh, newly established presence on the East Coast. Uh, and we're happy to be teaming with you on, on these efforts. Um, so with that, I, I just want to focus on, you know, Tom really kind of covered the, the technical aspect of, of the partnership and where uh, AeroVironment sees that going. And so I want to give the, the academic perspective from KRI and Northeastern about how um, we support companies like AeroVironment um, and others um, with our partnership model and, and sort of how we enable um, really the acceleration of innovation through these partnerships. Uh, next slide. There we go. So, so you already heard about the lab today. And um, so it's good that we had that opportunity earlier to play the video and to, to sort of brief everyone on uh, the great uh, facility that we have there and, and what we can do. Um, but the point I wanna drive home um, here quickly is that you know, one of the ways that we support our partners on the innovation campus in Burlington is through the one-of-a-kind research facilities that we have. So our partners are given you know, access to, to these facilities that you can't find anywhere else. And the, the Expeditionary Cyber and UAS Lab is one example of that. Um, Peter mentioned another one being Coliseum. Um, and we have others as well. And, and, and it's a living, breathing ecosystem, right? That, uh, that's constantly being uh, updated and adapted to serve the current needs of the research community. So uh, expect that in, the, in the, the future that that will continue to grow and, and, and will add you know, new enabling facilities and labs to, to really push the state of the art forward. Um, so just highlighting some of the technology breakthroughs. Um, so one of a kind facilities is one, the actual research component and the technology breakthroughs um, that we're able to uh, push forward is another aspect of how we support our partners. Um, so, so on this slide, you see some examples of some of the technology breakthroughs um, that have come out of work at, at my lab um, through partnerships, either with uh, industry partners or, or government partners. Um, you know, ranging anything from uh, centimeter level positioning um, with autonomous flight control. Um, this is actually done, uh, the plot you see on the top right um, is it, taken from inside of our anechoic chamber. And uh, the units um, that you see on, on the scale there are in centimeters. And so what you see is that um, using uh, some of the systems we've developed, we're able to get very, very pre precise navigation in indoor environments where we don't have access to things like, uh, like GPS signals. And then uh, moving down the list, another uh, very important component is, is, is real-time GNSS for denied environments. Um, and we're exploring ways to do this using software-defined radios where um, environments where um, it may not be possible to get a GNSS signal, uh, the satellites don't have reach, it's an indoor environment, or it's a, it's a denied environment, um, how can we enable systems that rely on GNSS signals? Um, it's a core component of how they operate. Um, how can we uh, and continue to allow them to, to operate? Um, and then you'll see some other examples of some of the technology breakthroughs um, you know, with, uh, with the other things listed on this slide. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, once we have developed the technology breakthroughs, it's the technology demonstrations. Uh, so it, sometimes it, uh, you know, just because you've developed something doesn't mean it's always gonna be a success. You have to make people aware. Uh, you have to let people know about um, what the new innovation, what the benefits of it are, and um, and how it can impact their mission or their operations. And so uh, we support our partners through aiding them with technology demonstration and linking them with uh, key mission agencies in order to uh, to to really um, forge additional uh, partnerships to to bring that that technology to the forefront. Um, and, and I know, uh, you know, we're out of time for this panel discussion and, and there's just so much to discuss and I wish we had more time, but um, I'll, I'll throw it back to Peter so we can move on to the next group.
Thanks very much, uh, Matt and Tom. Uh, again, uh, terrific presentations. And now we're on to the third and last uh, team in our panel today. And this is the MIT AI Accelerator with the Air Force. And at this point, I'll hand this off to uh, Captain Victor Salsa Lopez, uh, Air Force, and uh, Professor Sertash Paraman. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so I would like to really quickly uh, make sure that I am sharing the right one here. Uh, so yeah, we are from the Artificial Intelligence Accelerator. We are a um, group uh, that um, just started. Uh, so we have about uh, 13 months now uh, of, of really good work under our belt. We are a joint collaboration between the Department of the Air Force, MIT Main Campus, as well as MIT Lincoln Lab. Um, our mission to advance, educate, and deliver, uh, and really make AI real, technology is real, uh, for both airmen and guardians. Um, the power of this organization um, is really not within uh, the, the airmen, though we're, we're an important part. Um, it's really with the 90 MIT staff, faculty, uh, students, um, graduate students, uh, at times undergrads as well, um, that uh, they're helping us with uh, different research projects, as well as the 60 Lincoln Lab staff. Um, and together we're trying to figure out ways to kind of push forward uh, the boundaries of um, different artificial intelligence technologies that could be useful in uh, the operational environment for the Air Force. Um, to advance, uh, to, to do this, we've uh, committed 75 million over five years um, with substantial involvement between the Department of the Air Force as well as uh, the MIT entities. Uh, we started with uh, 11 projects. We have a couple more in the pipeline uh, that we're going to be ready to uh, announce shortly. Um, and to get these projects off the ground, we required all of the uh, faculty um, at main campus as well as at Lincoln Lab uh, researchers to identify research, um, which could really help at both the tactical oper and operational level uh, for the department. And to do that, we paired the uh, PI, so the principal investigators, with the tactical end users, as well as the program offices, um, to ensure that there was a transition pipeline that was funded, but also useful for um, all the different uh, tactical, you know, options that, that we had. Um, and then we brought airmen like myself on. Um, so we brought in 10 uh, active duty airmen uh, and we're connecting uh, the Department of Defense and Department of the Air Force um, and helping kind of guide the research to ensure that uh, we're creating things that at the end of the day can be effectively transitioned um, to the, the broader Air Force and uh, Space Force. <clears throat> we also have the mission to educate um, the Air Force. So airmen uh, need an understanding of what AI and ML can do um, and what it cannot do um, and how to affect their own uh, organizations um, so that we can best implement some of the strategies that we're learning uh, along with our partners at MIT Main Campus and Lincoln Lab. Uh, we're getting together to create an education pipeline um, with MIT to bring back to the force um, so that we can better uh, utilize the uh, great innovations that are happening on campus as well as at Lincoln. Um, and then to deliver. Um, Lincoln Lab is a, a huge part of our partnership um, and they kind of have the um, you know, industry cornered for us on being a uh, FFRDC that has non-compete with industry, um, but they can really quickly demo and prototype with us um, and then bring things to the stakeholder um, while we continue to research with our, our main campus uh, compatriots. So they're a really important part of this. Um, and then the program office uh, from the Air Force perspective and the Space Force perspective is important because they're the ones who at the end of the day actually have to end up buying and funding this for us. Um, AI ethics is another huge part of the accelerator. Understanding how to have uh, artificial intelligence technologies which are responsible, equitable, traceable, reliable, and governable, avoiding the black box of information um, that uh, a neural network might give um, so that we can understand how to have both robust algorithms, but also explainable algorithms um, that we can then use to make command decisions. Uh, also, data use has been huge um, and getting a ins uh, institutional review board information sheet about um, how human subjects might need to uh, be incorporated. Are we going to be doing um, cognitive monitoring or human machine teaming? And if we're using human subjects to research on, um, how do we do that from a legal perspective? Um, and we wanna make sure that we're not developing in a vacuum. Um, these technologies are going to be important for the department, but also department for our country um, and all of the citizens. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that we're not developing these technologies in a basement somewhere, uh, but we're doing it in a way where our graduate students and our PIs and our researchers um, can have a say in how we might be using these technologies, what different uh, ethical considerations we need to have and how we're going to deploy them in a way that will make them proud uh, in the defense of democracy. And then just about an hour ago um, or so, we just launched our new uh, AI challenge page. 
Um, so you can go to the QR code with your phone. Uh, just uh, put your camera up to the screen right now, or you can go to aia.mit.edu, which is our website, um, and you'll be able to find different artificial intelligence challenges that we have um, and how you can get involved with the AI. Um, through these challenges, we're going to be putting together data sets um, and we're going to uh, bring out the AI community um, across the world to kind of help us go through this data and figure out what are the best practices, best ways um, to incorporate some type of use case um, for whatever data set that we have on there. Um, and we're hoping in, by doing so, we're going to be able to have more democratization of this information, um, as well as, again, uh, have a open discussion on how we might use these technologies in the future um, and what risks there might be uh, by bringing it open to the, the larger community. This is open for anyone, academia, industry, individual, gov um, company, etc. cetera. Uh, so aia.mit.edu slash challenges. Um, with that, I am going to quickly pause and uh, hand it over to Sertaj so that he can show you a little bit more about the exciting stuff, which is uh, the actual quadcopter, small UAS, and agile flight work uh, that we are working on with his lab. Sertaj? Thank you, Salsa, for the great introduction, and, and hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sertaj Karaman. I'm a professor in the aeronautics department at MIT. I'm also the incoming director of LIDS at MIT, which is a laboratory for about 30 faculty members focusing on data science and autonomy at MIT. It's a part of uh, the College of Computing, um, uh, the, the new College of Computing that MIT is setting up. Um, and as Salsa mentioned earlier, um, we are working with the Air Force in this um, large scale multi-million dollar project. Uh, there's um, 10 plus projects that are all together within this ecosystem. And I'm just going to talk on, about one of the projects. But I'd like to say that all of the projects are um, have a very heavy and deep basic science component. Yet at the same time, they are projects that are ripe for technology transfer and commercialization, especially working with the government as well as other industry members. Um, so let me kind of quickly um, kind of go through and describe the one project that we're working on. As I said earlier, this is one of 10 plus projects that are a part of the AI accelerator. Um, the name of our project is Transferring Multi-Robot Learning Through Virtual and Augmented Reality for Rapid Disaster Response. Uh, it, it looks like it has all the buzzwords that are available now on the market into one title, but it actually does make a lot of sense. Um, the problem that we focus on is rapid disaster response. So this is the kind of problem that uh, when a disaster happens, for example, that you wanted to go out, find people, even provide them with supplies in, let's say, the first half an hour, maybe even 15 minutes. Um, this is typically the time when there's almost no human responders on the ground, or there's just a few, even uh, for them, the coordination is hard. So you can imagine UAS systems that are deployed into this area, for example, from a large aircraft parachuted in as a ground station, fly out from there, go find people to help, as well as find people to work with uh, in responding uh, to the disaster. So now this is really an, an extremely difficult problem for a number of reasons. Um, one is uh, for UIS to really understand their environment so that they can navigate in such an unstructured space that already is quite hard. Uh, but you kind of pile on top of that UIS that need to work, UAVs that need to work together, as well as work with other humans. Um, and also, because this is rapid disaster response, you need to um, have these UAVs move at operational speeds, typically move extremely fast through challenging environments. Um, so enabling this, even if you have technologies that will do this, testing them in a safe way is a challenge. So what we do is to test and develop these systems, we actually use virtual and augmented reality systems that I'm going to show you in a second. So the, the, the structure will be that we'll learn these kinds of policies of multi-robot coordination, even coordinating with humans, in virtual and augmented reality environments and, and, and sort of try to transfer them uh, to, to real environments like this. Um, this is just a, a quick summary of the projects. If you have any uh, questions, I'm happy to answer later. Um, needless to say that we do have a large group. I'm, I'm only one of the two MIT PIs in the project. We have a number of PIs from the Lincoln Laboratory. Salsa is um, quite extensively involved and, and we have a number of students and, and Lincoln Laboratory staff um, executing the project. Um, so let me kind of show you what kind of technologies that you need to develop. And so um, here is a video um, that is beaming from an onboard camera of a drone. 
Uh, it may not be streaming extremely well, but if you can't, if you could see my screen, what you're seeing is a drone flying very fast, up to let's say 30, 50 miles an hour in a forest-like environment. This is human pilot. This video goes to the goggles of a human uh, drone operator, and the operator operates this drone in real time to do exactly this. This is already extremely hard um, for robots to do. We cannot possibly, we cannot yet demonstrate these kinds of technologies in a very robust way. Um, I'd like to note that um, you know, about a year and a half ago, um, I had teamed up with um, my um, sort of longtime sponsors, NVIDIA and Lockheed Martin, kind of, um, they have teamed up with the Drone Racing League to organize a challenge called the Alpha Pilot Challenge. Um, and what we did is in this challenge, we said that, okay, you know, we're gonna run a autonomous drone racing challenge where people kind of submit their software code and, and you know, we run the code in real drones um, and real drones compete in a drone racing challenge in an environment that we set up. Um, I always thought that we would get maybe like 15 teams that fly and we would do a DARPA style proposal and we would pick the top 10 and they would go and compete. Uh, we had about 500 teams apply. So thousands of people uh, tried to get into the competition. So we needed some sort of a down selection mechanism. And so my group took that on uh, very rapidly. In just three months of time, we developed a simulator, a realistic simulator. And we just told people, we provided the simulator completely open source. And we told people that here's a course that you need to follow throughout the simulator, send us your code and we'll just run it with the simulator. And the top 10 teams we're gonna take and, and put them into the challenge. And I'd like to say that, you know, um, in just three months of time, people developed extremely good software that could run through the simulation course. Um, so they run through the course one by one, but for the sake of the video, we put them together. So you're seeing like they're racing, but they're not actually seeing one another when they're running. Um, of course, there's a lot of people who crash into things and, and cannot do things right, but then there's a lot of others who can go extremely fast in this pretty complicated environment. And keep in mind the development time is, is just three months. And, and so what we kind of envision here is that um, it's quite interesting that we can do a lot of things in simulation. Um, I have a laboratory at MIT. If you can come to my lab with white walls and everything, I can show you drones that are flipping around and doing some amazing things. Uh, but yet, um, when you're, for example, at the Air Force, um, you're trying to procure a system, you would like to buy such things for rapid disaster response, they don't exist. And so our project aims to close that, let's say, simulation field gap that we face today. We're using a number of background IP from MIT. These are things that we worked on for years that we bring on the table for the project. Uh, one of them is called Flight Goggles. It's a simulation system that puts UAVs into VR and AR. Another one is called Chimera. Um, this kind of enables vehicles to understand where they are and you know, segment out objects and put these objects into a map that is prepared on the fly. And so our aim in this project is to take these two systems and their output and train policies in virtual and augmented reality, which then we can hopefully deploy um, in the real world. Uh, and as we do that deployment, you can imagine that we first start out with pure simulation, then we put vehicles on virtual reality, then we put them in augmented reality, and you can imagine that to be a little knob as you turn one way, you eventually get to the field. Um, and we're doing you know, a number of things to enable that. So I can show you a, a very quick you know, video of how things are running. Uh, we have quite a large uh, motion capture system, um, like a room that was shown earlier um, on MIT's campus. Uh, that is sort of dedicated to two groups, including mine. Um, and then we can put people, we can put vehicles there. Let me kind of run it in the beginning. We can put vehicles there, vehicles go around there and in a completely empty room. Um, but this is the environment that they then end up seeing. And this environment is just basically being back to them. And then they do the autonomy in this way. We can even put in one room vehicles and another room people. Um, I don't know why that exited. Let me quickly put that. Um, we can put sort of in one room vehicles and the other room people, and, and then we can um, sort of basically put them in the same virtual reality environment. Um, and in this virtual reality environment, there are actually, you can see the, what the drone is seeing uh, from its camera image. This is the avatar that my student picked for himself. Um, and you can see what the drone is seeing as it's following this person. And just to note that they're actually in completely separate environments, meaning that uh, you can safely test, for example, a UAV kind of working with a human in this setting. 
So this is a quick summary of just one of the projects that uh, we're working on. Uh, the project is just one year old um, and it's, it's still in early stages, but we were able to demonstrate some simple policies, for example, being able to learn in simulation, things like hovering or, or navigating, and then showcase the same thing in, for example, virtual reality. And now we're working on transferring all of these things um, into multiple vehicles on the one axis and also kind of much more realistic policies, for example, vehicles going through obstacle courses and things like that on the other axis. Thanks for your attention. If any questions, we'd be happy to take it, take the questions. Thanks so much, uh, Salsa and Sertak. Uh, and to all six presenters, what a fascinating um, uh, group of uh, presentations and work being done, and also a very interesting uh, diversity and partnerships as well. So thank you. Um, I would like to go ahead and uh, field uh, a few questions here, if that's okay. And Wasim, I think we have some more time for that. Is that correct? You do, but you're you're you got you, know, with, you got just over ten minutes. Okay, great. So we do have some uh, questions. I'd like to uh, maybe start uh, with a, a pair of questions from the audience uh, to uh, Aporva and Ralph. Um, the first of the, and, and I would like to ask the panelists, we have a short amount of time for Q and A. So if we could try to sort of do the speed dating here with uh, responses, that would be great. So for Porva and Ralph, the first one is, um, could you speak to the capability expected for the X band weather radar adapted to small UAS detection in terms of range and gap coverage to support counter UAS uh, BV, LOS, and UTM ops. Uh, and then the second question for Apuva and Ralph is, could you also use this technology to shut down UAVs in midair if they're in restricted airspace? Uh, over to you. So, uh, Apuva, you wanna, are you online? I am. <clears throat> so we can, did you say S-band or X-band? X-band was the question, X-band weather radar. Okay, so, uh, you know, the issue with X-band radar is, you know, you asked about range, you know, obviously uh, uh, we constructed Skylar so it operates leveraging a network. So you can basically adjust the range by increasing or decreasing the network size. So a single Skylar radar uh, is gonna reach out about 25, 30 miles. If you want to go beyond that, you have to establish a, a network accordingly. And uh, now, so basically, there is no limitation because of the network construct. Uh, and then the other part, uh, can you use that to uh, to shut down uh, UASs? Uh, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I don't think so. Okay, great, thank you. Um, here's a, here's a question for. Uh, or perhaps uh, Tom uh, Vanek and Matt, uh, um, uh, could you talk a bit about bi the biomimicry and uh, uh, if you think there's still an in, in interest area for uh, for industry in that? Oh uh, yeah, Tom here. Um, yes, yeah, so the 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 program uh, for the hummingbird that was a DARPA program. Um, and uh, for the uh, pterodactyl, that was really uh, trying to understand how the, that particular creature flew. Uh, there was some, some uh, understanding gaps in, in trying to sort that out. Uh, I, I have a, a, a reasonable uh, familiarity with biomimicry and, and looking to nature uh, to, to sort out ways to, to enhance the efficiency of flight, et cetera. Uh, I believe that uh, from an industry perspective, that it is certainly very much of interest uh, for a number of we reasons. One is, um, you know, as, as I think others have said, uh, you know, nature has had a long time and basically an infinite budget to get it right. So looking to nature is, is a, often a good way to, uh, to look at efficient ways to implement systems. Uh, we look to birds uh, to look at how feathers can do uh, microcirculation on the wing, and is there a way that we can incorporate that into uh, man-made systems in order to in increase their efficiency? 
biomimicry from a stealth perspective, uh, the closer you look like a natural object, the, the less uh, intrusive it becomes and the more uh, stealthy it becomes. So the, the, there is certainly still a, 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 a lot of research in this area and a lot of interest by industry in this area. Uh, and I think that will continue. I think that as the, the miniaturization occurs and we start to look at smaller and smaller systems, we will naturally evolve to systems that more look like natural systems at, at very low Reynolds numbers because they're, uh, again, nature has, has done a great job in creating systems that are extremely efficient. Uh, and if we, could, if we could reach those kinds of efficiencies, it would be amazing. Matt, any, any comments from you? Um, so I'll just add on to, to what you said, Tom. I mean, it's, it's an active area of research still. Uh, it's great to hear that the, it's, an active, it's, a, it's an interest area for industry as well. Um, I know academia, um, you know, I, I personally am not doing any work in that area right now, but I know it's an active area at Northeastern. Uh, we have uh, teams of researchers, uh, for example, looking at, at how um, bats fly and mimicking uh, you know, drone behavior and building drones, uh, vehicles themselves uh, that mimic the flight patterns of bats. Um, and going even beyond that, um, mentioning, you know, looking at feathers and things like that, actually looking at the skin of a bat and um, mimicking the material uh, that, that these drones are made out of um, for really optimized flight performance um, after the, the skin of a, of a bat. So, um, you know, there's a lot of work in that area. Uh, it's a really interesting area and, and, and certainly interesting to, uh, you know, hear the industry perspective on, the, on that from you, Tom. Thanks, Tom, and thanks, Matt. And I have another question from the audience. This, this may be for uh, Salsa and Sirtak, but I'd like to throw it out to the rest of the panel as well. And that is, uh, how about integrating ground sensors and onboard sensors. Uh, the questioner goes on to say, this will be more and more applicable as the density of aerial systems, uh, UAS and manned aerial goes up exponentially. Uh, and, and the question again, how about integrating ground sensors and onboard sensors? So I can, uh, you know, we all know that the 5G networks are being deployed across the United States. 5G brings tremendous capability. And so I, I fully agree that the integration of the sensor network needs to happen. But more importantly, uh, what happens with the information that we're integrating? Uh, I think a key element is, is that um, there has to be a decision maker. You know, is, you know, right now in an airplane, you have a pilot that makes decisions. If you know, we got to decide, is the UAS going to make decisions itself? Is it going to rely on an operator to make decisions? I, I think that incorporation needs to happen because if you don't have the decision maker, a lot of the data that you're integrating may not be effectively utilized. Right. Thanks, Roger. I've got a question for uh, Salsa. Um, and I think you're the only one on the panel that can answer this, Salsa. Uh, how does an Air Force active duty airman integrate into a team of PhD researchers to advance the state of the art. Uh, Salsa, can you share your firsthand experience with that? For sure. I think that it's uh, very similar to how uh, both uh, Raytheon and Aero Environment um, have integrated. Uh, I think uh, Purva mentioned that uh, there's a cross between Raytheon engineers coming to um, UMass as well as uh, students going that way. Um, and the Department of the Air Force is looking to do the same thing, really. Um, so we have MIT PhD research students um, helping us learn what, you know, how to spell AI and ML uh, before, you know, we start the, the walk crawl run or the crawl walk run uh, process. Um, as far as being integrated into the team, um, the first thing uh, is le leading uh, a team of, of PhD students, completely different leading airmen. Um, not to mention we have world-class PIs whose job it has been to lead great teams. Um, so it's really about me taking a little bit more of a back seat, um, but also being there to interface with the students uh, for the first time. So they understand that they're not building um, crazy things that, uh, you know, are, they're afraid of, of how that technology is going to be used in the future. Um, they have an airman to talk to about how exactly the technology is going to be used. And then we have an ethics panel to get even more of their thoughts, but to ensure that we're doing things the right way. Um, so step one, um, make sure that we have a, a great relationship between the two organizations. Step two, let the PIs lead. Um, and step three, let the students um, inform me about 
what the best practices are going to be moving forward. Thanks a lot, Salsa. Great uh, answer. And we really appreciate uh, your service and uh, uh, being on our panel today. I have a question that might uh, might be best for uh, uh, Surtac. Let me throw it in your direction and see what you think. Uh, where do you see AI and ML as being most relevant for uh, small UAS? Uh, path planning, multi-agency coordination, other, what are your thoughts on uh, the greatest relevancy? Yeah, that is, that is a good question, actually. I do expect um, improvements, especially with the, I guess when you say ML, uh, with the integration of large scale data into our algorithms. I do expect improvements in a number of places, but I would think that one of the things that will um, experience, I think, uh, earliest would be things like edge level perception. So, you know, imagine UAS or UAV systems that are operating out there in the world and, and they can see things, they can understand things. Uh, maybe they can go one step further. They can try to predict what things are going to do, uh, the, the systems that they look at, and they can do that very quickly on board. Um, I imagine, however, that sort of in the future, maybe after that, I think we will see sort of going up the stack, for example, uh, we might see better motion coordination with other vehicles. We might see uh, just, just better motion overall, then we might see um, better coordination with people. I think these are a little bit harder problems uh, that we would start to see ov overall as we move forward. I think it is quite a game changer, the fact that we are able to integrate sort of massive amounts of data into our algorithms. But I do think that it comes with tremendous challenges. Like for example, especially in the aerospace or, or defense domain, uh, we'd like to build algorithms that can explain themselves. They can tell us why they're doing, what is it that they're doing? Um, and and it, is, it is hard to integrate algorithms that say, okay, you know, I, I've seen similar things in data, so that's why I'm doing this. And then, you know, this exists in, in 10,000 other data samples. Um, clearly, you're not going to be able to show a human, be a human operator 10,000 samples. So you need to somehow make these systems trusted. Um, the fact that they are working correctly is not enough. You need to show that they're working correctly. You need to be able to prove that they're working correctly. And I think that's going to be an important challenge. And with that, I would, I would note that there are certainly things out there right now in autonomous vehicles we just cannot do um, unless we take ML approaches. I mean, you know, just being able to detect objects at, at a very high accuracy, um, we can only do it with, with data-driven approaches. And I think it's going to be quite a challenge to, to integrate them in. I think you're on mute, Peter. Is Peter on mute or is it just me? I'm not hearing him come through. Yeah, um, okay. you know, I've, I'm still getting used to the mute button. You know, we haven't been in COVID for long enough for me to really learn. Um, I think we may have time for one more question, which I'd like to uh, shoot towards Apoorva, if I could. Um, you really have an amazing example with the UMass Amherst Raytheon partnership um, related to weather R&D for 18 years. Uh, that's amazing. How have you been able to cultivate and maintain that? And this is probably the last question. So if you could give us a, a concise answer, but uh, you know, we've had a comparison of partnerships here and I think partnerships are a critical aspect of real innovation. So how have you made that work? I think the most uh important piece of this has been, uh, I think as Salsa pointed out as well, it's the personnel exchange. And you know, that works both ways, right? So when we have students here that get, you know, at, at the undergraduate masters, PhD levels, get hired by Raytheon every year after having participated in some of these projects, you know, they're bringing some of that passion that they had on those projects while they were at UMass to Raytheon. So they continue to, you know, push those projects forward while they're in Raytheon. Um, and likewise, you know, when, when Raytheon employees come back to our university to uh, you know, pursue their masters or their PhD degrees, you know, they just build up this relationship with all the PIs on campus that you know, when they are going to go back to Raytheon and plan future projects, you know, they immediately say, hey, I've been to UMass, I know what the facilities are like there. And I know we can get this particular project you know, 
completed really fast. So let's let's partner with them as we explore this opportunity. So if I can add to that, you know, Raytheon has a deliberate approach. We have a formal university outreach program uh, where we maintain relationships. Uh, it gives us, as you saw, the opportunity to stay on the edge of technology, push innovation, and get the latest and greatest best engineer exchange going. Thanks very much. Uh, Wasim. we could continue going. We've got great uh, questions and a terrific panel, as you've seen, but uh, Amanda uh, is, is putting the hook to me and saying we got to move on. So uh, we're going to hand it back to you, but thank you so much for the opportunity for all of these uh, talented groups to uh, speak to uh, speak to the team here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, I think that was a great panel.